Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> the subject I'll be speaking about is uh, forced debt restructurings by creditors in Israel following the recent uh, IDB development case. Um, I'd like just to make a note that I'm not completely disinterested having uh, represented a party, unfortunately, the party that lost. However, I'll try to, to bring up a, a more balanced view of it, uh, hence the question mark at the end of the title. Well, just to go to the brief background of the case, uh, um, around a year ago, in the midst of 2013, the bondholders of IDB, IDB Development, the largest holding company in Israel, submitted an unprecedented motion to the, the Israeli bankruptcy court, claiming that the company is insolvent, and therefore they can take over the company by exchanging some of their debt into 100% of the equity. Now, it's important to uh, note some of the key facts, which is, one, the company was paying all its debt as they become due until then. It still had around 1 billion shekels in its cash. It had a debt of uh, 6 billion shekels to financial uh, lenders, but on the other hand, it controls some of the largest companies in the Israeli market. So the court was faced with two uh, questions, which both were very unprecedented. One was, can a court adjudicate the company to be insolvent, although it's been paying its debt and it has a billion shekel in its cash account? And secondly, if it's insolvent, can the creditors uh, coerce uh, a debt restructuring upon the company without the consent of neither the shareholders nor the board of uh, uh, directors? So with respect to the second question, the court uh, gave a positive uh, uh, answer, and I'll deal with that later. But first of all, what did the court uh, look at when he dealt with the first question, which is, is the company insolvent or not? Uh, Judge Danziger, in the beginning of the day, spoke about valuations. And IDB, I think, is the greatest case to judge valuations. And for those of us who still think it's a scientific uh, issue, there were four valuations in the case. The first valuation was submitted with the, by the creditors when the case began. They uh, thought that the net asset value, the NAV of IDB, was minus between one and two and a half billion shekels. Obviously, the company's appraisal was uh, exactly on the opposite extreme. It was plus between two and a little bit over three billion shekels. That's a large spread, I would say. And there were two other valuations were, which were somewhere in the middle. One was submitted by the creditors of the parent company, which shared the interest of uh, the IDB company because they were next in line to receive the assets. And uh, also an, a final valuation by a court-appointed expert. These valuations uh, were plus, but between 0.7 and 1 billion shekel. Now, the really interesting uh, issue about this case is that after having four valuations, we also had a market valuation. Because at the end of the day, the company was put to a bid, the parent company was put to a bid, and the market price was based on a value of 1.13 billion shekels for the company. So um, after you know, discussing the, the facts, let's go into the two main questions that the court has faced. There were a lot of formal arguments and uh, linguistic, you know, what, what's been written in, uh, in, in some of our laws, what are the precedents, but I'd like to try and focus on the substantive arguments that the parties have brought or should have brought. And the first question is, when is a company deemed insolvent or specifically, if a company is paying its debt as they become due, can it be deemed insolvent only because an external evaluator decided that at the end of the day it will become insolvent because the assets are less than the liabilities of the company. And this was, as I said, an unprecedented question in Israeli bankruptcy as well as the second question, the more important question. This also was an unprecedented question. So the creditor's argument uh, is uh, the following. If we can prove that the company is going to be uh, insolvent, because the assets are less than the liability, so we'll wait another half a year, another year. At the end of the day, the company will not be able to pay its debt. What happens is that once we can ascertain this, we understand that the shareholders are becoming option holders. 
they stand to lose nothing, but if they're able to take high risk, they stand to gain something. One could even argue that the uh, uh, best uh, strategy for the shareholders is to take the entire cash and buy lottery tickets, because they can never uh, lose, they can only win. So the argument of the uh, creditors was, why wait? It's inevitable, let us take over the company today and not let someone else run our business. On the other hand, what the uh, shareholders have answered is this is the inherent tension between shareholders and creditors because it's exactly the mirror side from the creditors uh, point of view. They would like to take no risk at all because obviously they stand to lose but they never stand to gain anything. Moreover, the case itself, both the valuations and the outcome just shows how uh, difficult it is or perhaps uh, I would say more than difficult, dangerous it is to judge a company to be insolvent just on the basis of appraisals. During the trial, most of the shares of the IDB subsidiaries, which are traded in the Israeli stock exchange, th their sh share price has arisen around 50 to 100 percent because of market trends. So arguably, it's very hard to make this kind of prophecy and say, guys, Let's declare the company insolvent. It's only a question of time. Um, at the end of the day, the uh, court uh, has uh, introduced a new system to uh, discuss insolvency. I don't have enough time to go into it. It's an interesting system that was composed by the expert appointed by the court. I will, though, uh, note that uh, we had um, a research done both in Israel and in England, and we could not find one precedent in which a court adjudicated a company to be insolvent solely on the basis of uh, negative net equity. So this was the first question and perhaps the less important question. The primary question is, okay, let's assume that the company is insolvent, let's assume we've proved it one way or another. Either it didn't pay a debt or there was enough uh, compelling valuation to ascertain that the net asset value is negative. Do the creditors have a right to force a restructuring plan which, by which they take over the equity, or do they need to go into the historical or you know, the usual way of putting the company into liquidation? Until IDB, everyone went through liquidation. We had a few uh, precedents which were beginning to approach the IDB idea, but in all of these precedents, either the board was for the restructuring or the majority shareholders, there was never the question in which both shareholders and the board were opposed to the restructuring and the creditors thought they could do it themselves without going through liquidation. So again, what are the arguments on both sides? The main argument on the creditor's side is very simple. Once we've proven the company is insolvent, it's our company. Yeah, I'm using these terms because whenever we begin a restructuring negotiation, usually this is the first or second sentence the creditors' council says around the table, guys, it's our company. And if it's our company, we can choose whether to use liquidation or to go into restructuring in which we take advantage of the going concern value of the company. If we decide we want to restructure the company, it's because, it's because we... Uh, understand that putting it through litigation, like the example you gave about a 363 sale or other sale, we will probably lose value and there is no reason why we should lose value in this scenario. The other argument is that recently in Israel, we still do not have a fully developed cram down mechanism like the American one, but we have something which is very similar. In uh, Hebrew, we would call it 350 Yud Gimel. It's a new subsection to uh, our uh, company's law, which says that you can cram down a restructuring plan on a class of, share of, uh, uh, of uh, creditors if you can prove that they will see receive nothing in liquidation. And the argument says if you can cram it down on a class of credit, uh, creditors, why can't you cram it down on the class of the equity holders? And finally, the claim that kind of connects to what uh, Judge Kaboob uh, mentioned, mentioned in the beginning of this day. In Israel, most of the companies are controlled by a single uh, sponsor. And the argument is, well, 
it's nice to bring up theoretical arguments about the board having some kind of, uh, um, um, uh, I would say, discretion to think what's best for the company. But at the end of the day, we know, so they argue, that most boards are not disinterested. They do what the controlling shareholder tells them to do. So actually, it's us creditors, and there's no real one on the other side who has a legitimate stance on this. So these were the creditors' arguments. What are the shareholders' arguments? Well, the first, uh, the first uh, argument, which actually has not been discussed by the court, but it's very interesting, is that having um, creditors being able to coerce a, a restructuring plan on a company would be inconsistent with our creditors' rights laws as they relate to secured creditors. Because it's a principle of Israeli law that a secured creditor can never take possession of his security. Unlike many other regimes, in Israel, if you have a security and you are able to foreclose on it, you cannot take possession of it. You must put it to a market test, the value of it, through a court-supervised proceeding. And what we have here is a bit of a peculiar outcome because a secured creditor, even if he had the right under the security agreement, can never take possession of the asset. But an unsecured creditor can take possession of the entire company through this theory. So this is somewhat of an inconsistency. Secondly, the argument is that allowing creditors to force a restructuring would lead to um, bad incentives or bad outcomes from several groups. The first, uh, the first one is that instead of incentivizing creditors to help companies to get healthy, to rehabilitate, to give them waivers, perhaps postponed a debt payment, whatever, they have a very high incentive right now to help, I would say, the company go into liquidation. Because once the company is insolvent, they have more options. They can either go through the regular uh, liquidation or they can take over the company. Now, IDB was a case about shareholders and bondholders. But the principles that were laid there should apply to the entire debt market in Israel. The entire banking system vis-a-vis -vis the uh, companies is now subject to a very, uh, I would say, severe change uh, in the incentives. If until now you could assume that a bank would try to push as much as possible the company from going into liquidation because he would stand to lose some, something, perhaps now banks will start thinking differently because they can gain in insolvency and not only lose. Finally, as uh, uh, Professor Squire uh, mentioned before me, what would happen right now, and this is also a point that was not discussed by the court, arguably, if the creditors take over the company, and at the end of the day, the company is worth more than their debt, they will be taking the difference unlike liquidation in which the shareholders would be taking the difference. So let, let us go back to the facts of IDB. Let's say that the court would have taken his own expert's view, which says that the company in the average was worth 0 0.8 billion shekels. And let's say that the debt was 0 0.9 billion shekels. The court would have given the company to the creditors, no question. But we know that the company was worth about 250 million shekels more. And we stand to see a situation in which creditors are getting more than their debt, more than their actual debt, which of course connects to the misincentives I've discussed before. So to conclude, um, I will not tell you if I think it's right or wrong, the outcome that the court has reached, <laughs> as I said. <laughs> but. I, I do think that the question is sufficiently complicated and uh, groundbreaking and changing basic principles of bankruptcy, bankruptcy to be dealt with by the legislator and not only the court. I think this is a very material issue and perhaps our legislator should deal with it and not just leave it as a court decision, which by the way wasn't even uh, heard on appeal for technical reasons. I also think, but I don't have enough time to develop on that, that there are some other ways to deal with the creditors' concerns, which are correct concerns, 
mainly through changing the rules we have uh, relating to the zone of insolvency period, which are a bit inferior to the rules in some of the other systems we've looked at. But you don't need to go all the way and give creditors the right to force restructuring in order to solve these problems. Thank you.